Okay, uh, welcome everyone to our Ag Policy and Your Farm webinar series. My name is Rick White and I'm the President and CEO of the Canadian Canola Growers Association, which we also call CCGA. We are so happy that you're able to join us today for the first half of, uh, for the first part of three agriculture policy webinars brought to you in partnership with our three Prairie Canola Commissions, that's Alberta Canola, SAS Canola, and the Manitoba Canola Growers Association. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get going. This session is being recorded and will be shared on CCJ's website after the event. Uh, secondly, for questions, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask your questions throughout the presentations. And we will have some time at the end of the webinar for our Q&A session. Uh, given that we have four speakers today, please include who your question is for. And if, uh, if you don't do that, we will try our best to address it with the subject matter expert. So let's get started. One common goal among the Prairie Canola grower groups is to provide solutions to government and industry on the policy issues that farmers face. And we advocate on farmers' behalf to government at the municipal, provincial, and national levels. By working collaboratively with partners in the canola industry and other ag associations, we are able to have a stronger voice to impact change for farmers. The canola industry has two influential voices at the national level, the Canadian Canola Growers Association, which focuses on policy issues impacting farmers, and the Canola Council of Canada, which focuses on the full canola industry value chain. On to our board of directors. Um, the CCJ's board of directors is comprised of, comprised of 10 farmers that each provincial canola association appoints. And the representation breakdown is we have appointed to our board three farmers from Alberta um, and two from uh, three farmers from Alberta and Saskatchewan, two farmers from Manitoba, and one farmer each from BC in Ontario. The, the missing uh, person on the slide here, we have a vacant seat, and so we are missing one picture for you, uh, but there are 10 directors and they're all farmers. So a little bit more about CCGA. CCGA undertakes policy development on issues affecting canola farmers. CCGA's policy team works to affect change on behalf of Canada's canola growers through our research on and development of policy alternatives. We represent Canada's 43,000 can Canadian canola farmers on national and international issues. And we advocate for farmers, uh, grower interests through direct representation to parliamentarians, legislators, and government officials. But effective advocacy takes a lot of time and effort and the right team. And these are the teams at CCJ that work to advocate on farmers' behalf. We have a policy development team, we have a government relations team, and we have a communications team. And you can see the various interactions and intersections between these three distinct but highly coordinated teams in our organization. For today's webinar, you'll get an update from CCJ's policy development team on CCJ's seven key policy areas. You'll get to put faces and names to the experts that work on important files that directly impact your farm, like environmental policies, trade and railway performance policies, business risk management, and more. So let's get going on this. I'm pleased to introduce our very first speaker of today, Mr. Steve Pratt, who's the Senior Manager of Transportation and Biofuel Policy here at CCJ. Steve serves on several multi-commodity industry and government initiatives, has chaired working group technical committees, and has authored a variety of reports and papers focused on Canadian grain transportation policy and supply chain issues. He is a past board member of the Canadian Institute of Traffic and Transportation and currently serves as, as the 50th pr president of the Canadian Transportation Research Forum. Steve has worked on transportation policy and systems planning for 15 years in both the public and private sectors in Manitoba and Ottawa. He holds a Bachelor of Arts a diploma in civil engineering and technology, master of arts in geography, and has completed a professional program in supply chain and logistics management. At this point, I'll turn it over to Steve to get things rolling. Over to you, Steve. Thanks, Rick. 
So yes, as Rick said, we're just going to jump right into this. So when you think about uh, transportation and how it affects uh, canola, how it affects the ag industry, and how it affects your farm, uh, I just bring your attention to that first bullet. When I think about this and when we kind of organize our work plans around CCGA, really the goal is to achieve an efficient, fairly priced, competitive grain handling and transportation system with sufficient capacity for co commercial demand of today and for that of tomorrow. And it's just several ways that we do that, uh, as you can see in the subsequent three bullets, is really um, focusing in on comprehensive um, supply chain measurement, particularly railway performance measurement, and uh, specifically in the transportation uh, of grain and grain products. Secondly is around the regulatory environment of the maximum revenue entitlements, um, and certainly as a government policy and then as, as administered by the Canadian Transportation uh, agency. And lastly is we, you know, one of the, the kind of major strategic issues that uh, has been identified years ago and then we continue to work on uh, today is around really uh, awareness raising, but then also um, looking at, um, you know, incremental proposals and solutions to address long-term infrastructure and policy issues, uh, specifically in the Port of Vancouver with its export profile and the importance to the green sector. Uh, as these both, those twin issues really, um, in our view, uh, and those that we work with really do pose uh, strategic uh, threats to the green supply chain. And, and again, with our export orientation and the um, gateway of Vancouver for our exports. So I just wanted to highlight um, those kind of three pieces and I'll just kind of explain on this next slide how we um, kind of go about doing that. And so, again, this is just a, a sampling and just a kind of a quick overview of how we you know, work towards uh, achieving and making steps towards achieving that vision. And, and the first one I'll just point out is the uh, Crop Logistics Working Group number six, which was uh, sanctioned in reports to our federal Minister of Agriculture. And we have a mandate there for two years. And, and certainly, um, uh, that is uh, got participation of uh, various uh, commodity and, and farm groups and, and industry groups and all coming together at that table to um, study, analyze um, issues, um, if there's policy and regulation or, or bills that are live, and then also other strategic issues and information sharing. And, and that's really, uh, really good. And, you know, in the aftermath of several uh, legislative initiatives over the years, um, this is a really good body to bring people uh, together, stakeholders together to understand and when possible come to a um, common position or set of positions uh, that we can relate to not only government officials in ag and transport, but then also the minister. On that piece that I noted on the first slide around data and performance measurement, certainly the Ag Transport Coalition is and some of the other um, grain monitoring uh, policies and programs that we have and we benefit uh, benefit from as a sector are important. You know, we've got the grain monitor, we've got the Canadian Grains, um, uh, Canada Grain Commission uh, weekly stats, we've got various Statistics Canada pieces, then we've got the Ag Transport Coalition piece, which has been in effect now for 10 years, uh, which really um, is the only way and is the only program out there of any commodity that um, looks at performance measurement and order fulfillment. So uh, important piece there. And certainly as I kind of have alluded to in the last uh, minute or two, um, we really work um, and it's very important to work collaboratively. So not only within the green sector with our shippers of products, be it on the um, processed oil side or on the bulk side, but also with other uh, rail users. It's common It's common network, it's um, common infrastructure. So we work uh, pretty closely actually with you know forestry and mining and um, you know, containers and other um, commodity sectors um, who have a vested interest in shipping and transportation on the Canadian uh, rail system. And really at the end of the day, it's bringing forward when required and proactively, uh, again, I, I put their reasoned and strategic policy options for agricultural producers, farmers, uh, for government and the Canadian public. And that can, can take a, a variety of um, tactics and, and formats, including things like um, you know, ads or advertorials or op-eds, and, and obviously going in front of decision makers and um, testifying at committee and, and that type of thing. So there in just a couple minutes is the overview of the transportation file and uh, how we think about it here at CCJ and how it affects uh, canola farmers and, and the ag sector. And I'm just gonna do a quick transition here to biofuels in my remaining uh, four minutes or so. 
And again, um, when we think about biofuels, uh, CCJ has been working on the biofuel file for over 25 years. So this is not a new thing um, around here, not a new file. And really, when we look at this, we um, have that kind of top line goal of, if I could just distill it down to its basics, establishing a regulatory environment that promotes canola biofuel production and consumption. Okay, that would be the top line goal. And in doing so, um, we work, we've established a longstanding canola, uh, canola biofuels working group. Um, obviously to influence uh, provincial and federal governments uh, to increase mandates and or policies that may, may achieve that goal. And we work closely um, as required with our provincial members um, in their interactions with their governments and, and certainly at the federal level um, of late. And, and again, a part of this, uh, which is gonna be, we'll touch on in a second, which is gonna be increasing importance in the future is around uh, life cycle fuel analysis and carbon intensity of fuels. And the government has taken it upon itself to create a new regulatory model for that. Um, obviously, that's got lots of, um, it's, it's, it's a huge undertaking, and really we're just monitoring that to make sure that canola-based biofuels and ag biofuels in general, uh, or biofuels that use agricultural feedstocks are not disadvantaged. And, and again, looking to, um, in doing all this, um, spur the establishment of a biofuel industry in Canada that uses domestic feedstocks. And again, with that bit of, uh, on that, that advocacy and that, um, uh, ex you know, explaining to the public and decision makers on, and and doing that kind of promotional activity as well. So just a quick, uh, for those who may be kind of keeping tabs on this file, certainly uh, the clean fuel regulation is the new forthcoming um, overarching regulation in Canada around biofuels, which will be replacing, in essence, the federal volumetric mandate. And I just note here that it's, it's a done deal. It's been published. It comes into effect this summer, July 1. And as opposed to a um, volume mandate where, you know, um, you know, there must be 2% or 4% uh, renewable content placed into fuel markets. This is going to set out a carbon intensity reduction schedule for obligated parties. So those who import and uh, supply or produce um, uh, diesel and uh, petroleum for consumption in Canada have to comply with this. So they're the ones that have to comply. And under the CFR scheme, there's a variety of ways that they can do this, one of which is biofuels. And for farmers, one issue that we've been working on a lot is this land use and biodiversity provisions of the clean fuel regulation. And those um, come into effect on January 1, 2024, 2024 rather. And for the most part, we've been able to um, get that to a place where we should um, ideally have no issues with compliance for um, Canadian uh, farmers to, um, to have their feedstocks going to CFR eligible fuels. And I just note at the end, this has been an ongoing um, uh, journey um, on, to get this regulation to where it is. And just wanted to point out that the CFR, uh, we do have provincial um, mandates and the, the CFR will sit on top of the existing ones. And so just very briefly, uh, as I said, it is now the, um, the law of the land, if you will, the clean fuel regulation. Um, it's very difficult to uh, specifically say how much um, canola will be used in this because there are various ways for compliance, as I mentioned. But really, I guess the, the, the takeaway here is that we have the playing field after six years. The playing field is set. And the rules of the game are there. You know, farmers, the processing sector, and uh, biofuel producers and petroleum producers in general now have an idea of what the rules of the game are can start out uh, to capture market share. And we have seen a flurry of activity in the in announcements in the canola processing um, space in the last year. And then certainly we now have um, you know, major um, uh, announcements coming from the um, from the, for renewable diesel investment in Canada as well. So again, last point is that we will, as the CCGA, as the sector will um, have to, this is not just because the regulation is done, we still have ongoing monitoring of this because there's going to be issues that uh, arise along the way. So I'll stop there, Rick, turn it back to you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, rail, rail is... Uh, so very important um, to, to farmers. It links us to our our domestic market, our national market, our international markets. Um, and so data on railroads, uh, railway service levels and performance creates transparency, which is helpful. And on the biofuels uh, regulation, that helps create the market and provides incentive for industry to invest in its, uh, its value added here right in Canada. Very positive for farmers. So thank you for that, Steve. Now we'll go on to our next speaker, Janelle Whiteley. Janelle is CCGA Senior Manager of Trade and Marketing Policy. She focuses on policy, legislative and regulatory affairs related to grain marketing, trade and market access, and innovation. 
Janelle serves on several multi-commodity committees, both in Canada and globally, and has chaired various working groups and has authored various policy briefs and government submissions. Prior to joining CCJ, she was employed in various capacities within the agriculture industry in Canada and overseas. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and Economics and an MBA from Royal Road University in Victoria. Floor is yours, Janelle. Over to you. Perfect. Thanks, Rick, and thanks for that introduction. And also, you know, big thanks to everyone who's joining us today on this webinar. Um, we live and breathe this every day, so we're always happy uh, to have an opportunity to talk about what's going on in the policy space. Um, so I'm going to present two uh, file areas of CCJ today. One is on marketing, and one is on trade. So these are the two areas that I lead. Um, at our you know, through our policy development work. Um, so I'm going to start with marketing. So first, you know, marketing really, you know, overarchingly, you know, it, it looks to ensure, you know, our goal is really to ensure an open market for canola and that canola farmers have access to the, you know, to the right crop inputs to grow a successful crop in Canada. Um, so this really manifests really in, in four ways. One is ensuring that we have accountable government instance institutions that, you know, recognize, you know, farmer requirements and make farmers more friendly policies at the end of the day. Um, second, that you know we have a transparent and balanced uh, grain contracting process uh, for canola marketing. Third, that in support of our open market, that farmers have access to you know timely. Uh, the right data to make, you know, production and marketing decisions at a farm level. And then that fourth piece around crop inputs and crop inputs is defined, you know, fairly broadly right from the seeds that you put into the ground to uh, to some of the labor requirements you're seeing on farm and some of the shortages that we're increasingly seeing um, on at a grain farm level. Um, so for for 2023, you know, some of our current current priorities to show how this, you know, kind of works out on the ground. Um, the first one is really modernization of the Canada Grain Grain Act and the Canadian Grain Commission. So back, you know, the government held consultations on the review back in April 2021. And leading up to that point, you know, CCJ, we worked with our different member associations and other partners kind of in the grain sector to develop, you know, a fairly comprehensive position. But what we, you know, felt that canola farmers needed to have an accountable institution and to ensure that, you know, you receive a fair return for your canola when you're delivering it into the grain um, elevator system. So to put this into perspective why a modernized Canada Grain Act is so important is that the last time the act was overhauled was in the early 1970s. So that time, you know, canola wasn't even a crop in Canada. Um, and whereas today, you know, it's our leading, you know, farm cash receipt and again, you know, a leading leader in crop acres, you know, across Canada. Um, so there's parts of the act that don't even, you know, recognize or don't provide the same rights to canola being delivered into a process elevator than there are into a primary elevator. Um, you know, also, as you can expect, you know, in 50 plus years, the way we grow, market, deliver a crop has, you know, our crop has also changed um, significantly. So this is an area where we put significant resources, you know, we work with our, our government relations team in Ottawa, you know, to continually uh, put Push, you know, for uh, new legislation in this regard. And legislation is really kind of the key piece as it sets the stage um, for us to be able to, you know, to achieve some of our recommendations at a regulatory and operational level. Um, you know, uh, maybe another big, you know, example for a priority in 2023 and, you know, one that we hope to see some movement in, in the short term here is around plant breeding innovation. So an example of that, you know, input, you know, side of the marketing file. Um, so plant breeding innovation, you know, we refer to it as, you know, gene editing. So it's at CRISPR, Cas9, so that next generation of plant breeding techniques and, you know, we, you know, CCJ really truly believes that seed innovation is, you know, the future and it will provide, you know, some of the solutions that we need to, you know, growing, you know, to increasing our yields to, you know, creating, you know, crops to meet our evolving customer demands and also on the sustainability front um, to, you know, fixate nitrogen or to deal with, you know, drought or, you know, heat stress that this technology has the potential to provide, you know, some of those solutions. Um, but to bring it forward and to get it into the hands of farmers, 
we need to have a policy and a regulatory framework in place in Canada that attracts investment, that ensures that you know our plant breeders and our life science companies have a clear and a predictable and cost-effective pathway to bring innovation forward, and that also that you know Canadian farmers have access to the same innovation as our U.S. and Australian or other you know uh, countries that we compete up against on, on a world stage. So uh, we had some success here in in May of last year. Health Canada published its guidance for um, food safety, and we are awaiting um, CFIA's, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency's guidance for environmental release and feed. So we are hoping that that will be published in the short term. And you know, we're still involved with you know outreach to government, advocating for the importance of this, and looking to have um, you know the three of these guidances, which we need to kind of complete um, this uh, complete this framework. Um, so I wanted to talk also just say I do have grower friendly contract terms here and so I want to talk a little bit about um, you know what we've been doing one of the initiatives or one of the projects that we have in this space so uh, CCGA uh, you know since 2014 has published you know a practical guide to navigating crane contracts and our policy objective here is really to you know contribute to a more transparent contracting you know process for grain farmers so it is solely a farmer resource um, you know it looks at some of the different contracts on the market you know where some of the what are some of the things that farmers should know in contracting grain it has some sample language to help kind of compare you know some of the different contracts on the market you know as well as some you know best management terms in terms of contract. So I believe Tanisha has put a, a link to the guide in um, the chat function, but if not, it's available at knowyourgrade.ca and there's a contract tab and there's also some other information on there around, you know, grading and, and dockage and kind of that, you know, uh, grade quality, you know, side of, of canola. So I'm going to switch, you know, now gears and talk a little bit about trade policy. So there is very much a natural extension here. So marketing, it's about growing and having access to the inputs and selling a crop. So then the flip side of that is then being able to sell our you know, canola internationally and into global markets. And the, you know the, the policy goals here, you know, are, are very much you know should be self-explanatory. Um, it's very much about maintaining an open market for canola and ensuring that we have clear and predictable rules of trade. You know that kind of govern the environment that we sell into. And why this is so important is that ninety percent of what we grow here in Canada is exported as seed, oil, and meal. So trade is is a very much a key success factor both you know at a farm level but also in terms of the competitiveness of the canola sector um so some of the the ways that this manifest is you know ccg works you know fairly diligently to promote and support a free trade agenda both in ottawa with our elected and non-elected officials to communicate just how important international trade is to canada how important it is to canadian agriculture and particularly canola and also you know internationally to promote um the role that free trade has in, you know, global issues like such as food security, you know, supply chain resilience, you know, and making sure that, you know, we can supply, you know, food to, you know, people of the world. Um, so there's various different trade policy tools that we have available to us. Um, one of them is some existing is to leverage our existing free trade agreements. So canola, you know, we have been lucky where we do have a free trade agreement that covers the majority of our markets. The exception would, would be China. So we have uh, the Canada US uh, Mexico agreement. So the replacement of NAFTA. We have the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is a partnership of leading Pacific nations. And then we have the Comprehensive and Economic Trade Agreement with the European Union, so some of our larger, um, larger trading partners. Um, another way that this manifests is, you know, we look to secure, you know, better rules of trade. Um, so this is so we understand how, you know, we or how our export, how our industry or how our exporters, so they have clarity in terms of how they execute, you know, sales internationally. And for us, this often, you know, um, deals with things called sanitary and phytosanitary issues. So um, differences in, in plant health standards. Um, for, for us, it often focuses on the innovation piece that, you know, to ensure that farmers have access to markets, but also the innovation um, to be able to grow a successful crop. So rules around um, trade and agriculture biotechnology, rules around crop protection products and maximum residue limits. And then that kind of moves into this, you know, creating also an environment that um, where we prevent, you know, potential threats to canola access before they are occurring. So through some of those trade agreements, through some of those rules and through international trade. 
Um, so just how, you know, 2023, some of the things that we are focused on, I'm just, just going to highlight one of those is that we're quite excited about the government's Indo-Pacific strategy. It was announced in, in November and there's a, up to $250 million to promote trade, investment and supply chain resiliency in the Indo-Pacific, including um, the creation of the first ever Indo-Pacific agriculture uh, and food office. So this is really a this an office we're pretty excited about. It's been something that CC has advocated for and has been working very closely with um, the Canola Council of Canada and our other value chain partners in terms of having more resources on the ground and capacity to deal with um, market access um, issues before they arise and if they do arise to have a solution in place before they take hold and they impact and they come back at the farm level. A few other initiatives, there's a WTO ministerial coming up this year that we're looking to create some momentum for, um, always working on the, our trade with the European Union and making sure our approaches to sustainable agriculture are, are recognized and then just largely trying to impact, impact an environment you know, where modern agriculture and innovation is, is recognized. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it back to, to Rick. Thank you very much, Janelle. Um, <clears throat> our work on grain contracts creates knowledge and uh, a better understanding to help uh, farmers manage their risk. And uh, as Janelle mentioned, innovation is absolutely key on so many fronts. And um, a st stable and predictable trade is also critical to our farmer success. So thank you for that, uh, that update, uh, Janelle, really appreciate it. Next up is uh, Justine Raftis. Uh, in Justine's role as CCJ's Manager of Environment and Sustainability Policy, she focuses on monitoring and participating in ongoing environment and sustainability policy development, uh, assessing change implications and researching and developing policy alternatives. Before joining CCJ, Justine worked in the agriculture industry in Saskatchewan, including in-field, carrying out water monitoring programs and working with farmers to design and implement ecological goods and services projects on the landscape. Justine holds a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Environmental Science degree. Justine, over to you, please. Great, thank you, Rick. I will uh, get started here and, and give everyone a little bit more background on the environment and sustainability file here. So, um, oh, there we go. All right, so really, you know, I just wanted to set the stage right now on why this file has been so busy, um, you know, why it continues to be so busy, and then take a look at a couple of the focus areas that um, have been taking up a bit of our time recently. So, um, you know, right now we are seeing an increased focus on where food comes from, you know, is it produced sustainably, and, um, you know, that demand is there, and it's higher now than ever to demonstrate that sustainability of farms to the consumers. So not only that, but we're also seeing, you know, this larger conversation happening around sustainable agriculture that isn't just happening in Canada, it's happening internationally. So, um, you know, there's multiple ongoing global initiatives that can and do impact Canadian policies um, and the national agenda, especially in this environment and sustainability file. So for example, here's something like the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, um, as well as the Paris Agreement. So these all come back to impact how Canada um, makes decisions in these areas. And you know we need to ensure that we meet our global commitments and our global reporting requirements. So that does impact our national agenda. And then finally, you know, we're also seeing companies commit to and adopt these environmental social governance um, and corporate social responsibility. Um, initiatives. So, you know, these all kind of tie together to make this um, this environment sustainability file a, a pretty busy right now. So, you know, I, I wanted to highlight here and I, I do want to kind of, you know, have a, a caveat here that these this is not an extensive list. This is not, by no means a fulsome list of everything that we, you know, go forward with. But, um, you know, a few things that I did want to highlight that we like to um, you know, highlight in the environment sustainability file. So the first thing here is farmer sustainability to date. So these are some of the things that we like to advocate for. So, um, you know, farmers understand the role that a healthy environment plays for their farms, their businesses, their livelihoods, um, and they have already been working to improve their sustainability. So, you know, anytime we're in these conversations around these environment and sustainability policies and initiatives and programs, really highlighting that piece of, um, you know, how we've gotten to where we are today and farmers have been doing that and farmers have been, you know, adopting these sustainable practices on their own. So making sure to really highlight that piece moving forward. 
The next one here is uh, ensuring outcomes-based approaches that are not prescriptive. So I like to think of this as a little bit more of that you know, regionality piece and advocating for flexibility for farmers in the environment space. Um, so having an initiative that maybe has a target associated with it, making sure that uh, the outcome is the focus and we're not um, being overly prescriptive on what each farmer should be doing. Something that would work for a farmer in Saskatchewan might not work for a farmer in Alberta. Um, and, and really just, you know, giving farmers that flexibility to do what's best for their farm um, and, uh, and, and highlight that regionality aspect. So another one that we like to highlight often is, you know, considering economics as part of the conversation. So sustainability is three pillars, environmental, economic, and social. Uh, so we just like to make sure that um, I know I'm in the environment sustainability file, but economics are just a, a, as big of a piece of the puzzle. Um, and we need to just make sure that that's highlighted and kind of a, a common theme throughout a lot of the conversations uh, that are being had at the environment uh, and sustainability policy conversations. So. And then finally, really just ensuring that the voice of canola farmers, you know, is in the conversation and is, uh, you know, at the table when decisions are being made that, you know, it might seem far, um, you know, the national level, level might not seem like it comes back to impact farmers at the farm gate as much, but it does. So just making sure that farmer voices are being heard. Um, Okay, so um, I'm, I'm going to dive into and quickly feature kind of three of the focus areas in the environment sustainability file. Again, not an exhaustive list. These are just kind of a few, um, you know, pieces of, of uh, my file right now that I just thought I would highlight that maybe are a little bit more recent or um, some topics that have been of interest. So I, the first thing I did want to highlight here is the sustainable agriculture strategy. So this is a a focus area since you know December 2022 when it was recently announced by Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Um, so AAFC launched consultations on the sustainable agriculture strategy at the end of last year. The strategy is really aiming to provide an integrated and coordinated approach to improving the agriculture sector's environmental performance. Um, it does have five kind of focus areas that are you know environmentally focused. So um, the five of them are soil health, biodiversity, water, climate adaptation and resilience, and then climate change mitigation. So we are participating in the consultation and we have also been asked to participate as part of the Sustainable Agriculture Strategy Advisory Committee. Um, and as part of that, you know, throughout our conversations that we're having on the committee and throughout the consultation that we'll be submitting here um, end of March, you know, we're really looking to advocate for a focus here on all three pillars of sustainability. I mentioned them earlier, but, you know, just making sure that this is the sustainable agriculture strategy. We need to highlight all three pillars. So that includes the social and economic side as well as environmental. Um, so making sure that that's part of the conversation and a theme of the conversations that we'll be having. Um, you know, highlighting science-based decision-making. So just making sure that farmers have access and can continue to have access to, um, you know, to the tools that they need on their farm. Um, and then finally, you know, looking to have this strategy acting as more of this overarching kind of um, umbrella strategy that houses all of the current opportunities, the current incentives and programs that are already underway in the, um, you know, environmental sustainable agriculture um, area right now because there there are a lot but making sure that we can use that also to identify gaps and improve in areas that need improvement so you know we continue to participate in this conversation and, and it'll be ongoing for uh, for the foreseeable future for sure so the next area of focus I wanted to highlight here is the fertilizer emission reduction target so um, under the national emission reduction plan you know there are goals specific to agriculture and that is where we see this 30% uh, reduction of GHG emissions associated with fertilizer application below 2020 levels by 2030. Um, so, you know, this target is uh, right now, you know, it's meant to be focused on prioritizing and optimizing, or sorry, um, optimizing nutrient management uh, while maintaining and improving yield. So this consultation did occur last year um, and, you know, CCGA and Canola Council submitted jointly to the consultation and participated in that jointly and you know our, our response really highlighted and advocated first with the underlying um 
you know, idea around an understanding that fertilizers are essential tools for increasing yields and for producing high quality crops. And that's something that we need to be focused on and doing right now. So that was really kind of an underlying theme to the entire consultation response. But I'll go over a couple of the, um, you know, a couple of the other points that we, we push for in that response as well. So the first thing here was keeping the target voluntary. So um, it, it has been identified as a voluntary target, and we just made it clear we would like it to stay that way. So um, that was one of one of the you know key areas there. The next one here was really around kind of that flexibility. Farmers need the flexibility. Um, you know, we need to keep that regionality piece in mind and making sure that we're not moving forward here with kind of a one size fits all approach because it's not going to to work that well. So um, that was another area there. And then you know, improved data and modeling is necessary. So this one did come with a caveat, you know, that we're not looking to increase the administrative burden here for farmers, but we are looking to just get a better understanding of, um, you know, a more coordinated and, and better understanding of the data that's out there, where we are starting from and, um, you know, to better understand where we're going. We also looked at uh, measuring emissions based on intensity and, um, you know, per bushel instead of absolute. And then finally, just incentivizing the adoption of practices such as for our enhanced efficiency fertilizers. So keeping that economics part of the conversation there. And right now we are awaiting reports um, and next steps from from AFC. So we are waiting to hear what will happen next. Uh, so a bit of a waiting game in this area. And then finally, my last area I want to quickly highlight here is recognition for environmental goods and services so you know right now this is kind of an area that we have been diving into doing a bit of research on ways that farmers can be recognized and rewarded for the work that they're doing and have already done on the landscape so things you know like riparian areas and shelter belts and pollinator habitat and is there a way to um you know recognize farmers for what they're doing because these these ecological goods and services benefit not only the farm um, but they also benefit the public as well so Right now, there is a program that um, has recently been announced by the government, the Resilient Agricultural Landscape Program under uh, the Sustainable Agricultural Partnership Program. And that's a $250 million cost shared program looking to pay for ecosystem services. Uh, we don't know what it's going to look like yet. It should look different in each province, but this is something that you know CCG will continue to monitor and provide um, any sort of feedback that we can in this area. So. I will leave it there and I will pass it back to you, Rick, and thank you all for listening. Well, thank you, Justine. Uh, there's certainly a lot going on here and it's provincially, it's nationally and globally. So, and farmers are impacted. So we need to get uh, to get the balance right for the sustainability pillars. Uh, and too often we focus solely on environment, but we it uh, sustainability is all about environment, economic and social pillars. So. Uh, thank you for reminding of that, us of that. Um, and just a quick reminder, please, if you have any questions, put them in the, in the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your screen, because that's our only mechanism to hear your questions. And we do have time at the end of the webinar to address those uh, answers in the Q&A box. So if you have some questions, uh, please pop them in there and uh, we'll tend to it uh, in the final 10 minutes. Uh, now for our final speaker, we have Michael Vadney. Michael is CCJ's Manager of Business Risk Management Policy, and he has spent nearly 13 years with Ag Canada working on his program branch, the branch responsible for BRM program development, before coming to CCJ. He holds a degree in Agricultural Economics, a Diploma in Farm Financial Management, and a one-year certificate in Ag Heavy Duty Mechanics. Michael grew up on a grain farm and oilseed farm in southern Alberta. <coughs> Excuse me and currently lives in Edmonton. Over to you, Michael, floor is yours. Thank you, Rick. Uh, I appreciate that introduction. Um, I just kind of want to you know, highlight why we have um, business risk management programs. Um, you know, it's, it's there to try to help producers sleep better at night. So if you sit there and go, what keeps you up at night? You know, um, from the producers I've talked to, you know, number one thing is is weather or the production limiting uh, areas. So, um, but as you can see, there's a lot of other um, issues and policy decisions that are being made um, by politicians and other countries that will impact you. So, um, you know, BRM is also there to potentially help with uh, helping you sleep when it comes to other government policies, whether that's domestic, foreign, or, um, you know, we're starting to see a lot more on the environmental side. Um, 
It's also there to help you with your input costs. It's there to help you with your cash flow. CCGA is a, a great place to come if you need assistance with uh, with cash flow with the advanced payment program. So BRM is there to um, help Canadian farmers and the agricultural sector um, have that economic foundation that they need so that they, they you know, in my mind, sleep better at night. Um, in order to reach the full potential, um, producers do need that backstop and need to be able to manage risks that can't be addressed necessarily through on-farm practices. Um, Canadian producers, they can participate in the business risk management programs. Um, they're pretty much national uh, across Canada. So um, and that, I guess that's kind of one of the benefits and one of the challenges with BRM is that, um, you know, we try to treat all farms the same when it comes to the programming, um, but there are regional issues and challenges. And so that's, you know, one of the areas that uh, will, you know, my, my files will be looking at is to try to, you know, advocate for those things that will help, you know, not just the grains and oil seed sector, but um, all sectors as well. Um, so right now we have a suite of BRM programs. Uh, I hope most of you guys are aware of this. So, um, and this suite works together as, as, and it should be viewed as a suite, not individual programs because each of them kind of covers different areas. Um, Ag insurance um, basically covers your production um, as well as some quality losses as well in some provinces. So um, that, that, you know, Kind of makes it so you can sleep better at night knowing that if it's a dry year or if it's extraordinarily wet or something that you're covered under under for your production losses agri stability uh kind of get in my opinion kind of gets a bad rap in that you know for the geno sector if i'm participating in egg insurance i'm never going to get a payment which you know it there are this way of saying that they do play against each other um but the thing to remember with egg and egg stability is that it is a program that protects providing coverage for all those other things that is not related to production. I mean, it could even cover, um, you know, if you have spoilage in the bin and you have a whole, lose a whole bin, I mean, um, that's not covered by crop insurance, but it would be covered under um, agri-stability. Ag-invest. Ag-invest is there for those small income declines or if you uh, want to use it for investment in your farm, um, there's really no restrictions on what producers can use the funding uh, for, through the Ag Invest program. Um, and, and I'll just kind of point out, Ag Insurance is a uh, actuarially sound program. So that means uh, it's an insurance program and there are premiums paid. Um, in general, the federal and provincial governments pay 60% of those premiums and the producers pay 40% of those premiums. Um, so it's fairly uh, heavily subsidized. Um, Ag Stability, fairly small fee to participate. Um, right now it's at 0.315% of, of your reference margin. So just an example for $100,000 uh, to participate and if you have a $100,000 reference margin, uh, it'll cost you $315 to participate. Uh, Ag Invest is uh, matched 50-50 with the federal government. You can contribute up to uh, $10,000 to your Ag Invest account each year. Um, and that would, but you're limited by your allowable net sales, which would be uh, if you had a million dollars allowable net sales, then you can contribute the maximum amount and the governments would match that. Um, there are some people that ask about ag recovery in the framework. This is not a program. It's just a framework for the governments to look at and try to evaluate uh, specific situations. And um, I think the biggest challenge with this is that it focuses primarily on what the extraordinary expenses are and doesn't necessarily look at the uh, the revenue side of, of a disaster. So uh, that might be something that we look at further in the, um, as we go along with some of the um, policy work there. And finally, we have the advanced payment program. Again, uh, this is available to, to pretty much any sector. Um, and as I said, CCDA uh, is, I believe, the number one um, administrative of the advanced, pro uh, advanced payment program in Canada. Um, so, as we're going through the business risk management programming, um, there's different reasons why it changes. Some of it's uh, budget, government budgets, it's shifting government policy, which we're, we're seeing now, um, and it's gonna, and industry demand. These all play together to try to come up with why, um, why the programs change and, and how they're trying to adapt. 
Um, so I think a big thing is, is that industry demand and we need to make sure that we have a place at the table. Um, that's one of the uh, strategic approaches that I'm trying to take here as, as a new BRM manager for CCJ, and that's trying to get a, a seat at the table with the uh, federal and provincial governments when it comes to talking about the development of the business risk management programs, whether it's changes to aggregate stability, make it more predictable, timely, simple, or you know, are we going to head towards more an insurance type approach when it comes to business risk management? Um, these things all you know, they're all going to impact producers at the end of the day, uh, but we need to make sure that they make sense and that producers are, would be willing to participate in them. Uh, just kind of some quick uh, updates on stability enhancements. Um, under the SCAP coming out uh, in April 2023, um, the compensation rate is going to go from 70 to 80%. Um, there's been some other changes throughout uh, the Canadian Agricultural Partnership, which uh, also enhance the, the compensation uh, provided under agri-stability. Um, the big one was removing the reference margin limit. So that really helped producers uh, make the program a little more equitable. Um, I just also want to highlight, like uh, with Justine is saying, the environment seems to be leaking everywhere. Um, so if you're going to participate in Ag Invest, um, you'll need to... Um, get an environmental farm plan in place so that you can continue to um, receive your matching contribution if you have allowable net sales over a million dollars. Um, provinces are also looking for ways to link uh, BRM to um, beneficial management practices that reduce uh, on-farm risks. And those are hopefully, uh, provinces are supposed to have those in place by 2024. Um, and finally, I just wanna uh, reiter reiterate that it, these programs are there for you. Um, so you need to take these, these into consideration and manage your farm the way that you think you need to manage it. Um, a lot of, I went through a lot of uh, um, engagement meetings this, this winter, and a lot of people told me that their accountants told them what to do. Uh, I think it's time that, you know, uh, yes, have discussions with your account, accountant, but make sure that you decide what's best for your farm. Um, and just what last thing, um, deadlines are coming up. Uh, in Alberta, perennial crop insurance uh, deadlines the end of February. Um, yeah, for BC or, or for the other provinces, uh, crop insurance deadlines are the end of March. Uh, and then for Alberta again, uh, April 30th is the deadline for crop insurance. And agri stability deadline is April 30th for everybody. Thank you, sir. Back to you. Thank you, Michael. BRM is uh, certainly the farmer's toolbox to help them manage their business risks and Programs need to be relevant as risks and farms change over time. So uh, thank you, thank you for that presentation. Okay, uh, now it's time for the Q and A session. Uh, we'll move on on to that. Uh, just a reminder: please put uh, your questions in your in the chat uh, in the Q and A function at the bottom, and um, and we'll go from there. Uh, first question I, I see here is uh, for Steve um, regarding biofuels. Steve, can you highlight some of the investments that have been recently announced in the Canadian biofuel space? And what does that mean for farmers in Canada? Yeah, sure thing, Rick. And um, thanks for the question. So certainly when we think about the canola uh, biofuel supply chain and the biofuel supply chain in general in Canada, uh, we were really, you know, if this is a, discussing this five or 10 years ago, it'd be a completely different conversation than it is today. I think we see that kind of policy stability in Canada and in other jurisdictions, sub subnational jurisdictions, BC, then certainly in the states, and some of the um, the opportunities we have down there, we saw a year, a year and a half ago, a flurry of the canola processing uh, announcements that are starting to come online and will be coming online in the next year or two. Um, mostly domiciled there in Saskatchewan, but again, many of them in um, publicly announcing these investments were tied to and predicated to some degree on. Uh, increase in biofuels. And then you know, most recently, we have seen um, um, some of the uh, major um, petroleum companies in Canada. So we've got the, uh, the proposed uh, AGT Federated Co-op uh, renewable diesel plant in Regina. Um, in late January, we have the announcement from Imperial Oil about the their um, green lighting of the renewable diesel uh, facility within their existing refinery complex in Strathcona, $720 million investment. Uh, again, for, for on the renewable diesel front, and there's a couple other um, more minor, uh, smaller um, renewable diesel plants um, 
rolling in Canada here on, on, uh, towards the West. Um, but all that to say is that um, this didn't happen in a vacuum. There are steps that led to this. Um, and, you know, this is a long term, um, this is a long term file. Uh, and we're starting to see now the investments back up some of the policy and advocacy work that our group and other groups have been doing um, for years now. So it's really an exciting time, I'd say, in, in that on that file. And certainly, as, as you alluded to earlier, we'll have a, um, an, uh, a dedicated hour on this in the middle of March, another webinar. So that would be a great opportunity for us to um, and those who are interested to more fully unpack all that. Thanks, Steve. We have uh, we have a question now for Michael um, in the in the Q&A. Um, regarding environmental farm plan, and the question is: <clears throat> Is it is it going to be required for agri invest in the future? And when will this be required if a producer does not have an environmental farm plan? Do you have a suggestion for the steps required and time frame to get an uh, environmental farm plan in place, Michael? Thanks. Um, so the environmental farm plan is going to be required by um, to produce it by twenty twenty five. Um, and this is for producers that have over a million dollars in allowable net sales. Um, so those with less than a million dollars, they won't necessarily have to have the environmental farm plan in place at that point. I do see, this is my projecting out now. Um, uh, I do see that they'll potentially require this for all farms eventually, um, just kind of the way that the linkages, they're trying to link the environment and BRM. As far as uh, steps to actually get an environmental farm plan, I. I don't have the specific steps. Uh, so um, I do know that in Alberta, it goes down to the county level. And so you'd have to work with somebody with the, within your county or municipality to get that completed. But it is something that I could look into and um, you know follow up on. Thanks, Michael. Um, we have one here regarding sustainability, and maybe I, I, I will just uh, take a quick uh, introduction to it about some of the international work that we're doing regarding sustainability um, beyond Canadian borders, and it gets into the uh, space of uh, the uh, FAO and the uh, Committee on World Food Security at the FAO. There's a lot of discussions coming from that uh, venue or that uh, organization uh, and the world is talking about it. And that's only one venue where it's happening. I mean, we have caught 15 discussions on climate. There's a whole host of international events and conferences and input and feedback and submissions uh, going on. Um, and CCJ is active in that space. Um, we are present uh, internationally to some degree, um, particularly in the Rome-based agencies and focused on uh, the... Uh, um, Committee on World Food Security, where, where we actually have a seat at the table as part of the private sector mechanism to the UN Committee on World Food Security. Um, so there's a whole bunch of sustainability issues going on globally in terms of the glo uh, global entities and global uh, countries around the world are all grappling with uh, the sustainability question of what needs to be do, uh, done with it. It's starting to influence our, our national governments like Canada in some of the policies that we see coming forward. So given that's coming at us, the question really is for Justine. Um, and the question on sustainability is what do farmers need to do to get ready? Or are they already? Or are they ready already? Um, over to you, Justine. Thanks, Rick. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I think that kind of ties back to, you know, the piece where I talked about highlighting farmer sustainability to date. So farmers, you know, we farmers already have a proven track record of, of sustainability. And I think just kind of continuing to progress that way. Um, you know, there are a lot of funding streams and new initiatives coming out through the government that um, do provide opportunities to maybe try out new um, you know, BMPs or new practices that can further sustainability on farm. Um, so really, you know, I guess it is kind of a bit of a two part answer in the sense of, you know, farmers are already doing great things out there on the landscape when it comes to sustainability. Um, and, you know, we're trying to make sure that we can tell that story well. And then really just, you know, these opportunities are coming are coming out um, and hopefully the sustainable agriculture strategy can be a way to kind of pull all of those opportunities together to make it a little bit easier to, you know, to understand everything that's out there. Um, but and, and to access, I guess, everything that's out there right now, but then to use those opportunities to, um, you know, to continue to further 
the sustainability on farm um, and lower those environmental footprints along the way. So um, a little bit of, of both, yes, I would say. <laughs> Thanks, Justine. Um, we have a question on grain contracts and it's for Janelle. Um, Janelle, can you elaborate on your work in this area of grain contracts and is there a Canada Grain Act review on the horizon? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, both kind of uh, very important kind of questions. Um, maybe just keep them, we'll take them separately and kind of bring them back together in the end. Um, so essentially CCJ's main um, kind of project in the grain contracting space is around our practical guide to navigating grain contracts. Um, so this has been a project that we've been working on now for 10 years. We initially kind of got involved because of a resolution that came up through one of our member associations. And like I, our guide's real objective is to try to create a more transparent, you know, grain contract space and to provide, you know, farmers with more information on grain contracts and, you know, help, you know, hopefully to help provide and to be more confident in that process. Um, you know, and if this guide can be used or can be leveraged to kind of advance, you know, more fair and balanced grain contracts, you know, we're also very open to having that conversation. Um, where this maybe comes into the grain contract review. Um, so the, there is an open review of the Canada Grain Act right now. Um, the government finalized their consultations in 2021, and we're still waiting for like their pathway or next steps that actually brings, you know, legislation forward in Ottawa um, to actually reform the act. So um, we're, I guess we're technically still in the review, but we still need to see that next step. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, the Grain Commission and their potential role in grain contracts. Contracts, and there are some opportunities for them to potentially act, you know, as, uh, you know, to play a role um, in this space. Thank you, Janelle. I think we've exhausted the questions. Uh, we are right on time here. And so therefore, this does conclude today's webinar. Uh, please make sure to register for the next two webinars coming up, uh, March 14th. Um, that one is more about biofuels with Steve Pratt. And on March 16th, uh, on our advocacy efforts in Ottawa with Mr. Dave Carey. So use the links in the chat to register for those. Both of those are at 12 p.m. Manitoba time. That's central, central daylight time, Manitoba time at noon. Uh, the session recording, will, uh, this session recording will be posted on ccj.ca next week. So look for that and follow CCJ's social channels to get notified when the recording is up. So thanks to everyone who took time to join us today. We really appreciate it. If you have further questions about today's presentation and you can email communications at ccga.ca. As well, the provincial canola grower groups are always open to hearing, from, uh, hearing farmer feedback on how they can best represent you on policy issues. So if your comment is more general in nature, I encourage you to contact your provincial association. So with that, thanks again for attending everyone. We really appreciate it and have a fantastic day. Bye now.